before a licensed game is released and revealed to be terrible, as is so often the case, the guys promoting it will say just about anything to persuade you that it's the ideal companion to your favourite TV show or movie. One of the ways to do this is to proclaim that the game is canon. What this basically means is that instead of a frivolous spin-off, the game is considered to be as important a part of the fictional universe as the original storyline. Which becomes problematic if it's a bit rubbish. Uh, something that, if I can refer you to my previous sweeping generalisation, is pretty much inevitable. Probably the most high-profile and involved attempt to make a game that was part of the canon was Enter the Matrix on the PS2 and Xbox. The Wachowskis were heavily involved in production, even shooting scenes on the set of The Matrix Reloaded specifically for the game. According to Wikipedia, Enter the Matrix was designed, like the Animatrix, to be an integral part of the Matrix milieu. Milieu being an even wankier way of saying canon, somehow. What this means is while Neo is away kicking seven bells out of a hundred Hugo Weavings, you get to follow the story of two minor characters from the film, Niobe and Ghost, as they go to the post office. We're in. You got ten minutes until the post office closes. There's a ton of heat in the area, but the package is still untouched. Well, we can see where they may have not been in when it was delivered, what with the whole jacking into a computer simulation designed to enslave humanity thing. And they always deliver at the least convenient times. It's, it's fine. <laughs> But yes, if it enriches your experience with The Matrix Reloaded to know that elsewhere two of Neo's mates were having endless, tedious car chases, then I guess Enter the Matrix is an integral part of the milieu. At least it's better than the path of Neo. The Star Trek canon is a complex thing at the best of times. I mean, even Gene Roddenberry himself used to play fast and loose with the rules of the universe. Still, you've got to have rules. This isn't Thunderdome. So when classic Star Trek enemy the Gorn turn up in the new game, keen-eyed Star Trek fans will notice an inconsistency. While in the original series the Gorn were galactic neighbours to the Federation and the Klingons, always popping around to borrow a cup of sugar or initiate a ritualistic arena fight, in the game they arrive through some kind of weird, temporal, trans-dimensional wormhole thing. You can tell I had this explained to me. We have been attacked. The whole thing is further confused by a commercial for the game which features original Captain Kirk, William Shatner, having a tussle with a Gorn. I thought you had my back. Uh. Mm -hmm. Well, I have an answer for you, canon gripers. This Star Trek game, like the 2009 film it's based on, is set on a different parallel timeline from the original series where Kirk and Spock are much younger, right? Right. So, maybe the Gorn in the game have arrived through the same sort of time hole we saw in the rebooted film, spoiling for a fight after Kirk kicked their asses in the arena episode in the original series. In this earlier timeline, the Gorn's appearance through a space hole would be considered first contact. Done. Just don't ask me why they look completely different, because I've got nothing. To look at it, Ghostbusters has all of the ingredients right. All four of the original actors returned to voice their characters, along with several of the supporting cast, and Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd consulted on the script. Aykroyd even went so far as to say this is essentially the third movie. Except if it was the third movie, wouldn't we need some sort of framing narrative about post-traumatic stress disorder to explain why we're reliving the exact events of the first and second movies? God, funk the fire again. Like capturing Slimer in the ballroom of the Sedgwick Hotel. You gotta wear him down and fighting the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man in downtown Manhattan, and facing off against the ghost of a librarian, Oh boy! and negotiating rivers of slime, and trolling Vigo the Carpathian. How about a little sacrifice? Not a baby, but maybe a dog or a cat. And you get the idea. Prior to the release of Aliens Colonial Marines, back when we all hoped it would be an entertaining video game rather than the sci-fi fan equivalent of a war crime, I distinctly remember Gearbox saying that it had been inducted into the official canon. Before we go any further, I should probably issue a spoiler warning. If you have any intention of playing Aliens Colonial Marines, in spite of all advice to the contrary, then close your eyes, put your fingers in your ears and say la 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 la, or, or just click the annotation below to skip forward. Right, still with us? Okay. Bear in mind that Aliens fans took a real kicking when fan-favourite character Corporal Hicks suffered the ignominy of an off-screen death at the beginning of Alien 3. But you know, after 21 years, we've kind of come to terms with it, you know, moved on, grown as people, learned to love again. And most importantly, it's canon, set in stone. To quote the prophet MC Hammer, you can't touch this. So what is the first thing that Gearbox does? Hicks is not only alive and well, but kicking his heels on LV-426 while Ripley and Newton some other dude, presumably, fly off towards the events of Alien 3. Whose body was in your cryotube? That's a longer story. 
I care about one thing, taking these guys down. Like a giant brick dropped into a pond, Aliens Colonial Marines causes ripples throughout the entire Aliens continuity. You're not just left wondering who the unfortunate sucker was in the third cryo tube from the left, you're left wondering why Wayland Yutani spent the next two Alien films chasing Ripley when the planet is still riddled with aliens and they have the means to create a new Queen alien. Somehow, Gearbox managed to, in one little video game, create a plot hole so huge it sucked two entire movies into it. Oh, and because of them, these guys are now canon too. Soz. You remember the thing, right? Creepy movie about an alien parasite living under the Antarctic ice? Well, director video game sequel, also called The Thing, picks up where the movie left off, only it kills off one of the two surviving characters from the film right at the beginning of the game. Apparently he froze to death, although given that the entire camp was on fire at the end of the movie, you'd have thought he could probably just sit next to that. The Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull Award for biggest canon crime, though, goes to the decision to alter the plot in order to bolt on the world's most generic government conspiracy reveal. What the hell? Stand down, soldier. Good to see you, Doctor. We need to talk. All in good time. But first, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask for your weapons. Of course the government knew about the virus. Of course they were attempting to harness its power as a biological weapon. Of course a deranged scientist injected himself with the virus and plans on releasing it on the world. Of course this undermines the atmosphere of the original film. And that's it. No, wait, actually that's not it. I've got an honourable mention. The Goonies 2, The Fratelli's Last Stand on NES and Game Boy. Arriving before the internet allowed fans to endlessly argue over what's canon and what isn't, The Goonies 2 confused a lot of fans of the original movie, particularly over here in Europe, where we live. Because the film never had a proper sequel, because the original game of The Goonies was never released over here, and because of the movie-style box art, plenty of people assumed that the game was a canonical sequel to the film, or at the very least a time for a movie sequel that they just couldn't track down. That's fine, sort of, except that the game introduced fantastical elements to the plot, most notably the damsel in distress, who was a mermaid called Annie. Well, that's based on the assumption that you find a mermaid less plausible than a pirate called One-Eyed Willy. It's a close run thing. The weirdest addition was Konami Man, a company mascot who pops up from time to time in Konami games. He's hidden in some of the more difficult rooms in the game and provoked a sort of crossover, with Sean Astin's character, Michael Mikey Walsh, appearing in ensemble outing Konami YY World. We're gonna say... Probably not canon. Sorry. Right, that really is it. So like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and we'll see you next time on Outside Xbox. Well, Ripley, Newt and, I don't know, some other guy are flying off towards the events of Alien 3. Okay. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what I said when I was playing it. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I know. I know, right? <laughs> they do an autopsy on Newt. Oh, right. But you see his body. Yeah. You see his body. Oh, my God.